a very warm welcome to the online dentistry show. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the kind sponsorship of Carestream Dental, who for several years now have embraced this topic of dental sleep medicine. We're going to link their strap line of changing lives with one of their digital partners, ResMed, um, who are one of the global providers of CPAP and mandibular appliances in that, in that field of medicine. Um, their strap line is changing lives with every breath, and what could be more appropriate in a time of COVID pandemic when we're looking at the importance of airway and how we breathe. The COVID pandemic gives us opportunities. It gives me the opportunity to welcome you to my practice and to Armagh. And this is the ecclesiastical capital of Ireland. And we've got the two cathedrals which represent the two main religious traditions in Ireland. These traditional cathedrals are built on, they've lasted many centuries. And that's because they've got a strong foundation. The topic of dental sleep medicine does not have that foundation of education and undergraduate curriculum and it's one that we're trying to promote um, within our colleagues and acknowledge the British Society of Dental Sleep Medicine, Andre Didi Adasi, who are working hard at this at the minute. For those of you who provide this care already, I hope we can share and learn from each other through the comments and the chat in the webinar. And for those who don't provide any care, I hope that this experience will encourage you that it'll be the first foundation stone that you will want to pursue the subject and take it into your own lifestyle and then provide it to patients in your care. So when I returned from Edinburgh Dental School um, into the practice, um, my workflow was what we call traditional. Most of the work was orthodontics and some of it with children who we were managing with functional plans. It's usually twin block mechanics. Um, the aim of tilting teeth and a consequence or side effect of that was that these children then some of them displayed less symptoms and signs of attention deficit disorder in school. Their behaviour improved, their memory improved, all because they were getting a better night's sleep because their airway um, was better and more open. So how does that compare to a dental sleep medicine clinic and how do you incorporate, incorporate that into a successful general practice? This time the oral plans is we're managing adults, not children. The aim is to protrude the mandible again, but this time we need to do it very accurately. Um, we want to optimise that opening of the airway, not maximise it, but get the right position for that individual patient. And of course we want to eliminate and totally prevent any unwanted tooth movement. So accuracy we associate with digital. So what does a digital practice look like? Um, what does it look like for the patient looking from outside in? What's the experience of the patient going through the treatment? Um, what does our digital workflow look like? And more importantly, what is the outcome? We currently are in a digital revolution in dentistry. We've got digital smile design, guided implant placement, orthodontic planning and technology with aligners. We've got indirect CAD cam restorations. So is there a role for digital technology in dental sleep medicine? Along the way in our workplace, we gather up some tools and we, some of us describe these as business tools, um, but they can't be individual items. We must incorporate them into a workflow. We must adapt our workflow um, from a traditional workflow to make these work for us so that they can provide an outcome. Now, today we're going to look at basically Linda's story and this was the outcome. We linked up with one with CareStream providing the surgery and the clinical digital technology with intro scanning, and then with ResMed with the CAD CAM appliance called the Narvel. Um, and relationships are very important. Relationships with the um, lab technicians, with the company, with the, our suppliers and our local dealers. And we can't emphasize the success of this treatment really relies on a very good relationship with our patients and how we manage the patient. We must also have fun. The first emotion to be lost in sleep deprivation is the sensation of fun. And that's a major factor of how we break down in relationships, how it affects families, we bring that into our workplace, and it can affect our relationships with our patients. And success comes in different ways, the success for the patients, and we experience success um, last year at the International Digital Dental Academy Awards where we won the best dental practice, high technology practice. Um, later this year then with FMC we were at the Irish Dental Awards and we won the award for the best high technology practice 
um, this time with our digital workflow with the prosomnus appliance. So these appliances, is there much need for them? Well, they, there's a growth in um, the provision of them in America. And when we see the extrapolating um, growth of sleep medicine in America, we have to ask ourselves, why would we not be involved in this topic instead of why would be involved? So dental sleep medicine, how do we link the professions of dentistry and medicine? Um, but we, would also, we must also remember that at the centre of this is sleep. The next slide. This is usually where a lot of cosmetic speakers will show their before and after photographs. I don't have the story behind the smile. You're being invited into the patient's most private part of their, their house, into their bedroom. They're maybe disclosing for the first time their sleeping partners are sleeping in separate rooms. They find it embarrassing, I hear it all the time. Um, so I don't have the before and after photographs. But I would challenge any cosmetic dentist that my stories are more powerful. And as you will see later on, they're not just life changing, they're actually life extending. So I'm not going to tell you um, Linda's story, I'm going to let her tell it. Linda's very special. Before she was 50, she had a stroke. I mean, she's a driving instructor, so she relies on her driving license for her occupation. And uh, during the afternoon, she was having to go home and have a sleep, um, and just really being excessively tired during the day. You have to be very sharp when you're a driving instructor. And if I was tired, I couldn't work. I would, I would cancel my driving lessons and come home. I, c I couldn't socialise, I couldn't go out, I was always too tired. My son, he was fed up with me. <laughs> it's hard work for him because I was quite depressed for a long time and because I was so tired. She was being managed because she was being unwell and tired by her, her doctor, referred to the hospital, quite rightly, for, uh, uh, for management. And she was waiting for um, her sleep study, she got the results on a Wednesday and she was advised not to drive. Well, that day I cried the whole way home, all this time waiting on the appointment and then that's it. With the mission of her doctor we managed Linda, we got her in very quickly. I phoned Paul on, on the Thursday and he had me in on the Friday, made me an appliance there and then. And we were able to use the ResMed apnea link to adjust that appliance and check if it was working over the weekend. So Monday morning we got the results and we had got her back into normal range. The fog went away, the tiredness went away, energy levels went through the roof. We were able to relay this information um, with the, the sleep study to her doctor and her doctor gave her permission then to, to start driving again that day. I didn't know it was the sleep was the, the, the problem and now, how long, nearly a nearly year and a half now from having the, the Narval device, so it's life changing, it has been life changing. I don't know where I'd have been if I hadn't, a, I really don't, I don't know. So we see how Linda describes how sleep deprivation affects nearly every body system and every organ. And we have to ask ourselves, I actually get all my patients to read this book by Matthew Walker. It's very important to the patient and ourselves that we engage in this topic because it affects us as well. And Matthew's title is simply Why, uh, Why We Sleep. Um, chapter 6, um, I could describe all the, the adverse effects of sleep dep deprivation, but let's put a positive um, attitude towards this. And so it's why we should sleep. In chapter 6 he describes, um, scientists have discovered a revolutionary new treatment that makes you live longer. Very topical in COVID. It enhances your memory and makes you more creative. Well, we are all involved in aesthetic dentistry, cosmetic dentistry, so we rely and our patients expect us to be creative. It makes you look more attractive. I think I must get more sleep. It keeps you slim and lowers, lowers our food cravings because it affects your um, your appetite, your, your hormones, you're more inclined to eat fatty foods more frequently and bigger portions. It protects you from cancer and dementia. We've got beta amyloid which builds up in the brain when you're sleep de deprived. It's linked very positively to dementia and Alzheimer's now. It wards off colds and flu, so it's good for your immune system. How topical is that at the minute? 
It lowers your risk of heart attacks and stroke. We heard how Linda had a stroke before the age of 50, and not to mention diabetes. And we're going to meet Michael very shortly and tell you his story about being a diabetic. You'll feel happier, less depressed and anxious. Are you interested? Well, my challenge is why would you not want to sleep? Um, and why would you not be interested? Now, in cosmetic dentistry, we try to give our patients the visualization of an outcome. What is going to be the end result? And very often that is to mimic nature. And sleep, in sleep, we have um, the, the perfect architecture. And we have, it's made up of cycles. We've got a REM and non-REM sleep. And these cycles are in particular orders. They last about 90 minutes to 110. And ideally, we want to get them from start to finish. Each cycle is rep the end of each re cycle is represented by the REM stage. Um, and there's the blue bars that we see going through the night. But you can very obviously see in the hypnograph that they're not the same. So if for some reason, through the night, we get woken, we don't just go back to sleep and continue on. We go back to the start again. And the end REM stages are very important. Um, it's where our memory is consolidated. It's where our immune system is improved. And more importantly for us, this is where the muscles of the body relax because we don't want to act out our dreams. If you're standing on a roof and you dream, you dream you're going to jump off the roof, you don't actually want to do that. But relevance to us, if the muscle is relaxed, those are the stages in sleep where the airway is more likely to collapse. Also note that if we cut our, the, uh, the duration of our sleep in half, it doesn't mean that our quality is cut in half. It's dramatically reduced because we're losing that bigger portion of REM sleep towards when we're supposed to wake up. So we mentioned with the airway collapsing. Now, this is what we're going to focus on because our oral appliances, our mandibular advancement appliances, they only work basically where we've got soft tissues are going to collapse. And very, that region is going to be the back of the tongue and the soft palate. We can't really influence that nasal area or down around the vocal cords, whether it's surrounded by cartilage. So we, you want to pick up the right patient. You want to identify that patient. Um, so those who snore, that's an indication that airway is just not um, as stable. Males are more common, and more common as age goes on, and the main reason is because we get more, we put on weight. Women are more common after menopause because of hormonal changes. We've mentioned about obese, um, large necks as well, and these can still be fit people, American footballers with big, strong necks their airway is actually um, compromised and from very, very high profile sportsmen and women who have died because of that reason. And again, any anatomy that either reduces the airway in size or any hard structures that alter that anatomy, like a narrow arch if the, if the either jaws are set back, large tonsils or a large tongue. And also some conditions, for example, Downs, the tongue is going to be larger than normal, and the very famous Pierre Robin syndrome. And his monoblock was not devised as an orthodontic to plants, it was to open the airway in these young children. So we're actually going to treat a spectrum of conditions, from normal um, to an extreme version. So what is that spectrum? Well, when we lie down to, um, to sleep, we don't want that airway to collapse. We want it to stay open and the air is going to move freely. Um, at the other, and we just call, but if we take one stage a little further and the muscles get relaxed, we get a vibration, but the air still passes in and out. And we know just that is snoring. So how common is it? Well, nearly half of us actually snore occasionally. Um, and then a quarter of us would do it more, more or less every night. At the other end of the spectrum, we've got a condition called apnea, where we, we stop breathing. And we're going to deal with obstructive apnea. There's another version called uh, central sleep apnea, where our brain tells us not, to, not to, to breathe. Our obstructive apnea is that our brain tells us to breathe, our muscles are still trying to breathe, but the airway is collapsed. Now, at the extreme version, it can be totally collapsed. Um, and by definition, which will change um, if, depending on your location, um, it's usually complete or above 90%. It stops for about nine, for 10 seconds, and it's associated with a decrease in oxygen. And there could be plus or minus an arousal. What we mean is that you don't wake up, but your brain wakes up. Now, we have an in-between stage. Either the airway can be slightly narrow because of anatomy, 
are instead of the airway completely closing, it closes by more than 30%. And we've got the rest of the associated features as well. If we're going to communicate with the patient, if we're going to manage the patient and communicate with our medics, we need some language to do that. And one way that we do it is called the apnea hypopnea index. And that's the number of these episodes where the airway is closed or partly closed in one hour. Below five is considered as normal, but we don't want any in children. And depending on the number of times that we actually close in that hour, we define it as mild, moderate or severe. So what actually happens when we get an apnea attack? I could show you loads of diagrams, but I'm going to describe how I describe it to my patients, and it seems to get them engaged. So I just tell them, well, your airway closes, um, but you still want to breathe. So your muscles, your intercostal muscles, your diaphragm still work, and you can still see the person actually trying to breathe. They're building up the pressure in their abdomen, and then suddenly, there's enough pressure to overcome the blockage of the tongue or the, the palate. Think of it like the person has held their breath underwater and they've suddenly come to the surface and then they take a big gasp of breath. It gives them a scare. So if we get scared, the sympathetic nervous system kicks in, we get adrenaline, our heart rate goes up, our blood pressure goes up, cortisol, we get under stress. Um, and we want to get energy to fight and protect ourselves. So our body's clever, it releases um, glycogen to glucose, and that can be a major factor in a cause of diabetes related to this condition. And this is Michael. Michael um, travels to London, he's got a, um, a publishing company. He's up early in the morning, and um, being a writer, he's very creative, so he needs good quality sleep. So we made him have plans to um, manage his obstructive sleep apnea. He forgot it when he went on business, and the two graphs on the left shows glucose levels over 24 hours. Now, the horizontal blue bar is where his glucose level should be, and you can see that the line deviates from that quite a bit. When he came home, he put his plants in overnight, and immediately it was much better controlled. Now, what's the consequence of all this? Um, and why do we actually define mild, moderate and severe? This is the Wisconsin study. It's a longitudinal study over 18 years. And it follows a population. And those who have severe obstructive sleep apnea, there is a difference of death rate of 35% between the people who have severe sleep apnea and the normal population. So that translates into these people will die 10 to 50 or 10 to 15 years earlier than what they should do. Now, if we compare it to diabetes or smoking, it's much more excessive. But we have to translate into lifestyle. That could be the difference of seeing your daughter getting married or not getting married. It could be the difference of seeing your grandchildren or not seeing your grandchildren. It could be the difference of enjoying a retirement or not enjoying it. But we don't really see these patients in our practice, do we? Um, well, it's more common, it's increasing because we're getting obese. 34% of men and 17% of women. You will sometimes hear about the obstructive sleep apnea syndrome and that, all that means is that there's an associated tiredness during the day. And the lower, numbers are, are lower but they're still significant, 14% and 5%. And these patients are in your chair. And we will show you Heather later on, which is quite an embarrassing story for me. Um, but we hope we've turned her life around. Big factor, these patients, 80 to 90% are undiagnosed. Sorry, I said patients? No, they're actually you and me. We did a, a residential course last year and we gave sleep monitors to our colleagues and four of them um, had undiagnosed sleep apnea. So how do we actually manage these patients? Well, first of all, it's very important we follow the right protocols to protect ourselves medically legally, but also to manage the patient in their best interests. The only way that you can do that is actually associate yourself with some of the recognised organisations and bodies and um, these are the, the, the associations that I've been involved in as a member. The Irish Society, European Academy, who I've got their accreditation, and the British Society of Dental Sleep Medicine. It's very important to surround yourself like like-minded uh, colleagues and give this subject the respect that it deserves. Um, one of the main messages of today is, first of all, um, you have to look after yourself before you can actually look after anybody else. 
So we need to take this message on board and one of the key features of it is actually what we do during the day will affect how we sleep at night time. I tell my patients it's a jigsaw, a lot of the pieces of the jigsaw are face down and we must actually recognise the role that we have to take or our patients have to take and do that. Um, these are all on my website, um, please go and it'll, there are, I want to show you as many cases as I can. So this bit is called um, sleep hygiene and uh, it's, it's easily found. So I'd rather show you some of the cases and make, make it more relevant to yourself. So if we look at Linda, um, Linda had been to the hospital. Um, so she had already taken on board all the sleep hygiene and that's the first, first um, part of management. Um, she had been prescribed CPAP and the problem was there was a waiting list for it. Now being a driving, uh, driving instructor, she couldn't afford to be off the road. So she came to us with the recommendation from her medics. That's a big point that they actually recommended her to us because um, we can only work under their prescription when she's severe sleep apnea. So she'd taken on board the lifestyle. We will look at some surgical um, management later on, but that didn't apply to Linda. And we're going to look at the non-surgical. So CPAP, what is it? It was developed in Australia in 1980 and basically is a hoover in reverse. So all it does is inflate the airway. Now, thankfully, they've got a little more, more streamlined. Um, this is the main ResMed one, and it's not a continuous pressure now. The more advanced ones will actually alter the flow and depending on how you breathe. And we do have portable ones as well, which aren't, really aren't much bigger than the, the size of a mobile phone. The masks are more accommodating now as well, either over the nose or over the face. Um, this one can be a problem, it puts pressure on the mandible, and again, we're trying to bring the mandible forward. So when are these indicated? Well, the first major point is that I would never take somebody off CPAP. Um, it's the gold standard, and it's the only recommendation, first line management for somebody who's got severe sleep apnea. So somebody who's, who stops breathing, or partly stops breathing, for over 30 times per hour. But what happens if they don't tolerate it, or they don't want to have it, or they can't get it? because of local, um, local protocols, like Linda, it wasn't available under her health service. She had to go on a waiting list. Well, second line management is something that we can do under the help of our medics. And it's the mandibular advancement of plans. And there'll be loads of different names for these. But remember, it's a second line management for the severe. Depending on your local protocols or your country's protocols, this is from ResMed in France, the patient, if they're mild to moderate, CPAP or the mandibular plants is equally recommended and it's really patient choice. Um, in the UK, we tend, I would tend to treat um, just as mild um, as equal choice. I would still, so if it was moderate, I would still try and get them onto CPAP. And for snoring, the plants is actually first line management. How does it work? Well, think of it like um, basic CPR, basic life support, where you just, you want to lift that lower jaw up and um, you want to lift the tongue out of the way and put the soft palate in tension. And we can see this from one of the Somnomed um, appliances. The airway is quite narrow normally, and when the mandible is brought forward, the airway opens. Now, not only does it open in an anterior posterior dimension, but it also opens laterally. So there's a much more laminar flow in the airway. It's not as turbulent either. So how do these um, different treatment methods compare? Um, I tend to look upon this, the dotted line is actually CPAP and the solid line is the mandibular appliances. And we can see that really the only area where the CPAP um, beats the mandibular plans is actually because it's more effective. Socially, um, the mandibular plans is, is more attractive to the patient and to the patient's sleep partner. And one way of, of showing this is through the mean um, disease alleviation and we look at overall effectiveness of it so we're looking at how effective the appliances is and how compliant it is for the patient or the patient is. With CPAP it's very efficient but the problem is some patients find it difficult to wear. With our oral appliance they are they're easier to wear but they're just their efficacy isn't as good so we want to look at how can we develop our workflow to raise this efficacy because um, then we can actually not be a match, but for the right patient, we can actually, as you see with Linda, we can maybe outperform CPAP. 
So a very important part of actually increasing that efficacy of the plan is actually choosing the right, uh, the right patient and that involves our screening. Um, good screening is going to um, increase our successful outcome clinically. Um, it's going to achieve a better chance of achieving the patient's expectations. Um, it's going to increase the compliance from the patient because of the way they're managed. Um, and it's going to decrease complications and side effects. So it's going to reduce failures and that's very important as the way that I look at it. Um, so the first part of screening um, really comes from the first contact that the patient's going to have and that's just going to be your, your reception or your team. So it's very important that they're actually educated as well. You educate yourself but you educate your team because they will do a lot of the screening for you. And they need to be knowledgeable. There's no point in the patient phoning up and the team not knowing any of the symptoms or signs. They must get confidence in that you will be able to look after them. So what are the sort of signs and symptoms that we're looking at? What are the, the sort of the buzzwords that sort of make us um, have alarm bells? Well, obviously the patient's going to complain of snoring at night time. Um, there's going to be sort of witness of stopping breathing. That patient may describe the sensation of that gasp or they'll just somebody describe it as drowning when they wake up. They'll tend to want to go to the toilet quite a bit at night because of the increased pressure on the bladder. Um, sexual dysfunction as well, they're probably not going to disclose that. Um, but with males in particular, the testosterone levels are dramatically reduced and there's night sweats as well. During the day, and this is what I normally find the patients come and, and report and they complain about, they feel tired when they wake up. They're excessively tired during the day. So you've got to take into respect what they're doing. If they have young children, you're going to be tired anyway. But are they excessively tired? They have lack of energy. Morning headaches, that's a red flag one. Um, are they, is their mood affected? Are they depressed? And have they difficulty in concentrating? So before Linda comes to the practice, we had a lot of this information because I want to make her time more efficient and sometimes we can streamline the management. So before she comes to see us, I have a lot of questionnaires or history. We already have that information. Um, we can send it out through um, CareStream remote forms um, or she can get it from all the screening questionnaires from our website. And I'll go through these qu well, quite quickly because you can actually see them from our, web our, our website and you're quite welcome to do that. So we have a basic sort of pre-consultation questionnaire and that's going to give us information. What's the snoring like? How, how loud do you snore? Is it a problem for other people in the household? If you lie on your back, um, does it make it worse knowing that if they go on their side and it improves? Well, if the tongue falls forward, then we know that that mechanism of bringing the tongue forward is going to improve their, system, their symptoms. And it means that that's how the appliances really work as well. Do they wake up feeling choked? Um, obviously, we've mentioned people, if their partner notice if the they've stopped breathing. Do they go to the toilet a lot at night? And do they have a dry mouth? Um, we will focus later on on the importance of nasal breathing and mouth breathing. And do they suffer from headaches? We also want to know what's their weight like five years ago? What's their, their, their collar size five years ago to compare to now? Are they gaining weight? Because we need to bring in the sleep hygiene and address their daytime habits. Do they smoke? Is that irritating their tongue, their soft palate, making it inflamed? And again, what's their alcohol consumption? Um, are they taking it late at night? Um, that's going to make the, the muscles relax. Other questioners, I want to find out how tired they are during the day. One form of doing is the Epworth sleepiness score. These are very subjective and you need to be careful how they're interpreted because the patient will tell you what they think they should say. So if they say, I, I could be tired in every situation during the day, but I'm never tired driving. So we need to interpret, are they telling the truth? Some questionnaires are targeted to males. Other ones are targeted to females. And this is a very important one for me. And I rely on so much information from the sleep partner. Remember that these patients are asleep. They're not often very aware of their habits during the night. So the sleep partner just reinforces um, a lot of information for me. What happens if they don't have a sleep partner? Um, I still need some information. So a lot of the patients will use smart watches, their smart phones, with apps that monitor their sleep. They're not very useful for me diagnostically, but I think it's essential that the patient actually takes responsibility for their own well-being. And if you can involve the patient, your compliance will be much, much better. Now, if I want a bit more accurate information, this is um, a device that has transformed my clinic. 
um, is the Night Owl by Actisense. It's a Type 3 monitor, sleep monitor um, and it's extremely accurate. I can post it out to the patient. It connects onto their phone by Bluetooth and I can set it up remotely for multiple nights and it gives me a lot of information. So this is a typical um, sleep study report. Um, it's going to measure the ectopic heartbeats, the oxygen desaturations, duration of sleep and also physical activity and we're going to get that AHI. Very important, I do not use this to diagnose a patient. I can't do that, I'm not a medic, but I use it to screen the patient. I would also use it to titrate or adjust the appliance after we've fitted it. This is um, an interesting one, it's from my, one of our Kirstein friends, Paul Higgison, who some of you will know, um, travels globally. Um, at the weekend, his wife complained of his snoring. Um, the big problem was Paul was away from home a lot, and he was concerned, am I doing that during the week? Um, you know, what's my sleep pattern at like, like in hotels? Have I got obstructive sleep apnea? So the first two nights, we had an AHI of 10 and 7. So he's just slightly above normal, mid sort of mild um, obstructive sleep apnea. And then he sends through the one on a Saturday night, uh, 16. And I go, and that's into moderate. I said, Paul, something's happened, something's different. And he sent through the photograph. So he had just arrived home from Germany that night. He got a couple of nice Belgian beers or German beers and a couple of late pizzas at half 10. But that change in daytime habit, the late eat, eating and the alcohol was enough actually to put him into um, moderate sleep apnea. His habit at the weekend with his wife was, was different from his, um, his habits when he was away in work. Um, so Kirsten would be glad to hear that he was working very conscientiously when he was away. Sometimes I need um, something better. Um, now you um, I use the ResMed Apnea link. There's one of my respiratory consultants um, really insists on this. And I'm going to introduce you to Heather and you listen to Heather's story. My mum has noticed that I've stopped snoring. I used to snore really, really bad. And now she says she can't believe the house is so quiet at night. I only have the odd migraine, but it has reduced the migraines greatly. I'm happier in myself now, whereas before depression was getting to me. And now I feel as if I'm getting my life back together again. Okay, so a very powerful story from Heather. Um, and I have a confession to make. Um, I see Heather, I've treated, treated Heather in the practice from childhood. So she had this condition for a long time and it was only ever I developed my interest in it that we were able to manage her. So these patients are in your chair. Um, so let's look at some of her figures. Um, she had an NHI of 58. So 58 times per hour she completely stops breathing or partially stops breathing. And if we look at the sleep study in detail, some of those complete cessations of breathing were for 50 seconds. Her longest hypopnea was 70 seconds. Um, and her oxygen saturations um, were significant. Within two weeks of managing her with um, a normal appliance, we were able to get her AHI down to four, and um, below five is normal. So the statistics don't tell the story. I hope the video and Heather tell it better. This was a patient from a couple of weeks ago, and this is really quite frightening. It's probably one of the um, most severe cases I've had. We've mentioned about the AHI, and how significant that is for communicating. I actually look upon the desaturation of oxygen as possibly more significant. So this is Dion, um, who is a primary school teacher. She's 41, she had a BMI of 56. And her husband phoned, really quite concerned about her. She's starting to fall asleep in the morning, basically about an hour after she wakes up. Um, but look at her oxygen um, desaturations. Her lowest desaturation in the night was 48%. Now let's put that in perspective. If we're at base camp Everest, oxygen saturations are 77. Her heart rate um, in sleep was 122, and that's equivalent of the recording at base camp Everest. Um, at the summit of Everest, you've about 50%, and she's actually recording a 48%. So her body is under tremendous strain. 
So we were able to get her down into within two days she was on CPAP, uh, which was the gold standard. And we're able to monitor through her respiratory consultant and her AHI is now three. So Linda, we, she's waiting for a CPAP, but she wants something else in the meantime. So when she walks through the door, um, my assessment starts now. And she's a skeletal two, and that's quite favorable because we can bring, we you know if there's a reason why the, the airway might be getting obstructed. The skeletal um, relationship is bringing that tongue back, compromising the airway. So what happens if we have a class three? Um, that can be a problem. This is Patrick from Dublin, and you go, oh dear, um, class threes, I don't know how much I'm going to be able to treat that mandible. This may be um, a challenge. The other thing I look upon is how they're actually breathing. Um, I want the pa a healthy way to breathe is to breathe through your nose. Quite simply, if a vet goes to a farmyard and an animal is mouth breathing, he knows that that animal is sick. We're not supposed to breathe through our mouths. Nasal breathing, um, we incorporate that into all our patients. We try to instill it in our children as well in the practice um, because mouth breathing is associated with attention deficit disorders. If you mouth breathe, it really kicks in the sympathetic nervous system. Um, so let's compare it to nasal breathing. Um, it keeps the upper airway moist. Um, the flow of air is more laminar. It simulates the parasympathetic nervous system, so it calms the body. So this is why yoga pilates at night time is good. It promotes diaphragm breathing rather than that panic breathing from the intercostal muscles. And this is the miracle molecule um, in my mind, the nitric oxide. And just last week we have the studies that are showing that it's now being used on um, some patients who have COVID. It dilates the air airway when we nasal breathe and it reduces um, the responses to alterations in carbon dioxide and induces a deeper sleep. So let's look at this nitric oxide, it's really important. If we mouth, the nitric oxide is produced in the sinuses. So for mouth breathing, we bypass that, we don't get the benefit of it. And it reduces nasal congestion, um, it dilates the blood vessels, and more importantly, it improves oxygen transfer in the lungs. So to, and it, it's, it's the key, it's the foundation stone of what I do, and even with all our patients, whether they're going on for an appliance or CPAP, we promote the, the importance of, um, of nasal breathing. With mouth breathing, we're familiar with the, the usual signs and symptoms, that, that facial appearance of the child who's a mouth breather. Um, it's not just children. Um, we've got, I'd like you to meet Owen. Um, I'll let you see Owen's video and then I'll tell you his story. So Owen's breathing at night time is really quite frightening. It actually sounds painful. Um, it was videoed by some of his flatmates at university. He's a physio student. He's actually working in the, um, in the local hospital at the minute, um, in the respiratory department. Um, and he's taken on board the importance of breathing. His flatmates initially thought it was funny, and then they realized this is something really quite serious. And they, um, they actually kicked him out of his flat because of the noise. So Owen went to um, his doctor first of all, and then we were asked to have a look at him. And although his figures uh, with the sleep studies show that he had an AHI of 37, his oxygen desaturations were, were quite significant as well. Um, he came to us because he had heard about the appliances. He actually knows my son. I thought, right, your dad will make me an appliance that will sort me out. Um, not really. His, he, he was a different management. So he's very sporty. He'd already taken on board the importance of nasal breathing and he was using the nasal turbine cones and also the nasal strips because he had taken on board the, the work by Patrick McCone who um, promotes the Boteco breathing. Um, Owen's actually a semi-professional footballer and you know, he tapes his mouth um, to stop him mouth breathing. But 
The management of Owen wasn't an oral appliance. It wasn't CPAP. It was one of the surgical options. Um, he just got his tonsils out. And by getting the tonsils out, um, he came with an AHI um, of one. Now, that doesn't happen straight away. Um, when you get the tonsils out, you still have the habit of mouth breathing. And he had to train himself to actually breathe through his nose after all those years. So, and his oxygen improves as well. So we actually incorporate this, this technique into some of our appliances with the prosomnus, with the somnomed, with the narval, and the sleep well appliance, the tap appliance. Sometimes we use elastics to encourage that mouth to stay closed. So we need to examine the patient interorally now. We're looking at soft tissues. We're looking at signs uh, for bruxism, which may be associated with obstructive sleep apnea. Um, we're looking at the tongue. Is the tongue scalloped um, because of its excessive size or, the, or again due to bruxism? This is Sean. Sean was a skeletal class 2. Remember what we said that with Linda was a skeletal 2? That was quite favourable. Um, so when Sean walks through the door I thought, good, this is, this is going to be favourable. And we look inside his mouth. He's got a massive tongue. He's got a V-shaped arch. He's got crowding. And I have to get an oral appliance to fit in there. And this is one of the benefits of digital workflow because I can make an appliance um, which is going to be better tolerated. This is Ralph and Ralph was one of my first patients and there's a story behind Ralph that I just don't have time to tell. But it's very important not just to look for things that you can see. We score the soft palate by what's called a Malin Patty score um, depending on how much it obstructs the airway. It's very important to actually look for things that you don't see. And in Ralph's case, he, he came to us because he'd been on CPAP. His second ENT surgeon had recommended they remove the uvula and part of the soft palate, even though he was on CPAP. So it's missing and we lose the seal between the tongue and the soft palate. So even though he's on CPAP, he's still snoring. So we got him into a mandibular advancement of plants and he's wearing both now. We call it combination therapy. So look for things that you don't see. We mentioned about the importance of tonsils. We look at Owen and again we score these with the Brodowski um, Palatine tonsil classification. And we must know about this. We need to be knowledgeable and converse with our, the patient's doctor. Um, this is Ryan. Um, Ryan had been assessed by respiratory consultant. Um, they knew his tonsils were big, um, but they sent him to me to make an appliance because basically he was on an NHS waiting list. Um, with the knowledge that we have and the experience, it's working in teams with your medical colleagues. They thought, get him onto an appliance, this is an alternative. Well, I know an appliance isn't in his best interest. His AHI is quite low. If we get the tonsils sorted, he's not going to need an appliance. So by communicating that with him, um, he was able, he decided to go privately and get the tonsils removed and that was him resolved. So we move away from soft tissues and we start to think about um, the dentition because that's what's going to actually retain the, the appliances. So one of the things I'm looking for are, um, would be signs of parafunction and I'm asking myself, um, does the patient, does it sleep related bruxism? or is a bruxism, uh, bruxism at day time. Because when we see the patient, we only see that bit of wear. We don't know when it's actually happened. Um, the, relevant, the important point of this is that if we try to protect that dentition without actually managing the cause, we may actually make some of these patients worse. Because if we put an occlusal splint into some of these patients who are undiagnosed, we have studies that will show that the mean number of apnea events was actually increased. And that's mirrored in those who snore as well. So we must find out the actual cause of the, the bruxism. For patients who have erosion, um, are we working out, is, is the reflux at night a possibility because that when they're in REM sleep, their muscles are relaxed. During the apnea attack, the intra-abdominal pressure is forcing the contents of their stomach into the oral cavity. So again, we're going to look at the, the teeth and the dentition and the arches. So with Linda, she's got nice um, rounded arches. Even though she hasn't got much constriction in the lower arch, her tongue is quite big. 
Now we don't always have that number of teeth and I always think of the distribution of the teeth is probably more important than the actual number. And this is Sean and you can see that Sean has a lot of um, posterior teeth missing. So I, I'm starting to think about what type of plants I'm going to use here. Um, and for Sean, because of his, he was getting treatment done, we didn't want to go into a lot of um, expense in the appliance. Uh, so we wanted something that was cost effective. We wanted something that was going to be focused on the anterior teeth. So we discussed all the options and we he made the choice of going for a sleep well appliance, the tap appliance, because we're using the anteriors. Now, sometimes we don't have any anterior teeth in the upper, and again, the lower, uh, here we're missing the posterior teeth. So we're really struggling to get an appliance that's going to attach to all the teeth. So I would treat this patient more like an edentulous patient, and that's one of the benefits of the somnomed appliance, the somnodent, because the, the two components aren't connected. The previous tap appliance were actually physically connected, so if the patient opens, there is a chance that we'll dislodge the lower plants from the lower teeth. This appliance, the two components are completely separate. We need to do some digital imaging. And remember that this is basically an orthodontic course of treatment. So I would do an overview um, with an OPG. Um, Linda, there was nothing really of significance. Um, but sometimes we need to focus in on specific areas. The patient may have had orthodontic treatment in the past, and we may have short routes. And the benefit of digital technology and digital planning is that I can uh, communicate with the technician and we can design the plans very accurately that limits the amount of pressure on those teeth. There may be restorations. Again, we want to protect the teeth. This is a, a crown. We do not want to put any pressure on that tooth because that's going to move. Remember the twin block mechanics um, in a child, that's what, what these teeth want to do. They want to reduce the overbite and overjet by tilting teeth. The, obviously, the periodontal condition is vital. This is Jim, and Jim came from, uh, from Dublin. And Jim thought he was going to come up. He didn't fancy CPAP, and he just wanted an appliance because we, we, we discussed it on the phone and he says, yes, I've got, lot, I've got most of my own natural dentition. He might have, but if I was to put an appliance in there, he certainly wouldn't have them for very long. Um, and this is Fiona, a lovely young medical student. And again, we try to get an appliance that the patient doesn't object to, that they engage with, they want to wear. Fiona's only problem was her snoring um, when she was sleeping with her boyfriend. So she wanted something that was, wasn't very obtrusive. She wanted something that was discreet. Um, we look at the recession on the lower. Um, she didn't want that managed. Um, but again, I'm thinking, I do not want to have that twin block mechanics where I'm going to tilt that lower tooth forward. Then we take our intraoral. We see that her previous orthodontics has significantly um, reduced the length of her, uh, the roots on her incisors. So I can't afford any pressure on these teeth. She's 23. Um, so we go for a very accurately made of plans. We go for the prosomnus. Um, one of its claims is that it has minimal tooth movement. And also, more importantly, um, it's the way that it works is the twin block mechanics. We're bringing the lower jaw forward. We want to limit that tooth movement. So it's provided with um, uh, what they call a MOG, a morning occlusal guide that she puts in for a few minutes in the morning and it repositions the jaw back to centric. But the selling point for Fiona was that it actually mimicked her orthodontic retainers. This is a um, nine to 10 month review. So when she had puts them in when she's with her boyfriend, it looks like her retainers. She's not embarrassed and it's not obtrusive. You wouldn't want her having a CPAP machine at that age. We need to, to to be in control of something to monitor, we have to measure. And obviously, all my work's in the scanning. And at review appointments, I would tend to retake the scan. And I can use the software in the care stream to measure overjet and overbite. If there's any movement, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see that. So I can inform the patient. And then we can make a choice. Do we continue with the appliance or not? And these appliances do move teeth. This was a referral patient to me who had um, crowns in the upper, upper five to five. And within about nine months, she got an anterior open bite. Um, now, she had very big amalgams on the posterior teeth. And with her permission, consent, 
um, we got her back into occlusal contact. Um, she has decided that she wants to go back onto the plants again, um, but she knows the, knows the risks involved. We're going to get patients with, with dentures. Um, and the question is, do we make the plans for the denture in or out? And this is Ian, who lost his driving licence. Um, and we managed him very quickly with a Norval. Uh, so he's got, because his hygiene wasn't good, I really prefer to get that. Uh, I don't want him sleeping with the mandibular plants in on top of his dentures. But this is Mary, and Mary was a, a referral patient. Um, she didn't take her dentures out at night time. Um, so we explained oral hygiene implications, um, options available, and we were able to make the Norval over her plants. Again, one nice thing about it, um, the scanners that we use with Curastream, it's taking images of gold, acrylic, soft tissue, amalgam, dentine, the porcelain from the crowns. We communicate with our technician, we can design very accurately to not damage the, the rot class on our denture. Um, so digital technology has got much more benefits, and this is Mary with her plants in. Um, what about fixed prosthesis and implants? Um, so here we have, again, another Fiona. Um, we've got the anterior bridge. Um, I don't want to put a lot of pressure on that. We've got a huge amalgam in the back here. Um, there's a referral patient again. I don't want to we communicate it with the, the, the dentist. No plans to crown it. Um, but we've got an implant. So this is brilliant. I know the implant's not going to move. So we can relate to our technician, say we want maximum retention on the implant because it's screw retained. And we can take pressure away completely from the, the, um, the bridge and completely away from that heavily restored tooth. And sometimes we rely on implants. Um, this is one of the Somnament um, appliances. And again, we can use implants to actually retain um, the appliance. So Linda's incisal relationship, we've got an incisal um, two div one, very favourable because it means that I don't really have to open the, the occlusal vertical dimension, um, I can just procline the mandible forward. Compare that to two division two, um, we have to get the patient to open before we can actually procline them forward. This will have implications to how, because we're opening the mouth, the plant is going to be bigger and it may actually compromise the compliance of the, the appliance and we can point this out to the patient. Um, we've met Patrick before, this is our skeletal 3 patient um, and Patrick had no protrusion at all, um, he didn't want CPAP and we had a phrase, I remember saying to him, Patrick we're going to basically have a go and in this case even though he couldn't protrude Actually, just increasing the vertical dimension was actually enough to manage this condition. Class threes, I must mention as well, they will actually limit some of the plants that we use. We can't use um, a tap of plants. We're looking at arch form. Lynn's got nice U shaped arches. But if we've got a V shaped arch in the lower, that's going to constrict the tongue. The tongue is going to go backwards. If we have a V shaped upper arch, there's going to be a narrow nasal base. So that's going to leave it more difficult for that nasal breathing. Now we're bringing the lower jaw forward. So does that have an effect on the joint? Well, patients with two or more signs or symptoms of, um, of obstructive sleep apnea will have a greater incidence of TMD. Um, it's not a causal relationship, but there is a, an association there. So I'm going to look at, are there clicks? Um, what is the range of movement of opening? Is there a deviation in opening? Um, any clenching, any locking? Um, has the patient had a click in the past? Is that disc... Um, a non-reduced anterior displacement of the disc because when we open it and open the joint with the appliance the disc may uh, come back and the click may be re-established. So um, this is Janet and Janet came with quite a low AHI of 9 and uh, she just basically said snoring what well, it solved um, but joints a bit sore at times. Intraoral scanning, I do my own. I don't delegate it to team members, and I do that for a reason. One out of respect for the, the other dentists that refer to me. I think I have a responsibility to that patient. Um, it also means, I think there's a risk in digital technology that we actually lose that physical contact with the patient. We lose that communication. In children, we used to get able to feel, could they tolerate the impression? Could they tolerate the appliance? And I like to get that with adults. 
So when we protruded her forward, her jaw started to get quite sore. And when we looked at the joint, she had an arthritic joint. So not suitable, we got her onto CPAP. Digital imaging, um, we've looked at 2D versions. Um, I have the CS8100. Um, with 3D imaging, we can, there's, we can look at deviated sept septums. We can also look at anything else that's obstructing the airway, um, like tonsils. Now, we do have the CS airway model um, in the CareStream software. Um, it's very good for communication. Um, our medical colleagues will use it, but there is no association with um, is it reliable for diagnosis or predicting the outcome. So if we go to um, our intraoral scanning now, we have to record the shape of the dentition. And we all know the benefits of intraoral scanning. It's the same for um, most um, disciplines or treatments in dentistry. But we have specific ones to dental sleep medicine. Um, with CareStream, we have an open STL file system, which many manufacturers can use, so it's not closed. We have the multiple bite capture. Remember, I'm taking the bite in centric. I usually take one in maximum protrusion, and I take the, the protrusion that I want the implants made in. And I can send this folder through CS Connect directly to um, the lab. So with Linda, I use an orthodontic um, mode. Um, and with, but sometimes we don't have that intact dentition. Now, if I was to take an impression here, the only time I'm going to find out if there was an accuracy in the impression is when I go to fit the implants. Most of my patients actually travel quite a distance. So when I take the scan, I can have the facility of sending it to the technician and I can communicate before the patient leaves the surgery, is the scan good? Are you happy to make the implants on it? And sometimes we have to improve the image, but it means we don't have to recall the patient back. Now, we have the autofill um, feature in the software, um, but we don't really like to rely on that. It is useful for areas that are impossible to get at. But the reason why I chose the, um, the CS3600, it has the smallest tip in the market. So it means I can get round the distal surfaces of eights and also in bounded saddle areas. But we also have to think, when we're buying a piece of equipment, it can't be for one specific treatment. And I mentioned that a lot of my work is for children in orthodontics, so I want a small head. And I find the small head is invaluable um, with the children's orthodontics. It's also a fantastic way, it makes it fun. They watch their the dentition um, coming up on the screen rather than having this goo in their mouth. So um, when we're scanning, there are other features that we can adapt in the software. Um, there's the undercut tool facility, which we would use in restoration mode for crowns and bridges to check for undercuts. So I actually use this in a whole arch situation. We can see um, in this patient, we have no undercuts, which would show up in red on the buccal or labial surfaces. So I'm able to communicate that with the patients and we could have a problem with retention. And it gives me a, a visual aid to allow for consent because we can say to the patient we're going to use our aligner technology and use an orthodontic attachment directly bonded onto the tooth and then we can show the patient where the undercut is created. It, doesn't, it just helps the communication why we're actually altering their dentition, their dentition um, but also can raise if the, the plants may be compromised in any way, whether the outcome may not be as successful as what we would like. So we want to record that protruded position. Um, traditionally, I would use the George gauge. It does increase the occlusal vertical dimension, and particularly in a skeletal, in a incisal two division two, I don't really want that increased anymore. So sometimes I would revert back to what I use for children in their functional appliances and just use a little project. The benefit of the scanning, there's no physical bite going to the lab. So as long as I've got a stable and size relationship to record the bite, I don't need a physical bite. Um, now we mentioned about vertical dimension. Um, we don't want to open that too much because if I do, it rotates the mandible back and it will actually encroach on the airway. So how do we capture that bite? Um, it's really very, very simple. And there's a short video just to show that. So once we've actually recorded each individual arch, 
um, we use the George gauge or the ProJet just to allow the patient to get used to the positions. We get them to protrude and retrude into their maximum positions. Um, and then, depending on what's comfortable for the patient, I usually get them into about 50 or 60 percent. Remember that the more you protrude the mandible, um, the more uncomfortable it may be for the patient. And then to record that bite um, is really very, very quick um, with the interval scanner. And we're going to capture three bites. We've recorded our three bites. Um, one of the other advantages of digital, um, if you take an impression, it goes into a lab bag. But I can put the, um, the bites on the, patient, on the screen for the patient to see. And it helps communication, helps them to be involved in their own treatment. So I would show them that they've got, we've got taken in centric, maximum protrusion, and also that posture bite. And it's easy to explain to them that we may have to alter that position, that when the appliance is fitted, that's only the start. It has to be all, it has to be what we call titrated into the right position. We also check um, when the patient is actually protruded that they're not actually deviating, because if they do that, um, then the technician is going to make the appliance in a position where it's not normal, normal, and it's going to induce pain on the, the TMJ. So we can compare in the three positions, have they stayed in the midline? But if they've got a natural deviation, we must communicate that to the technician. So we've got all our records. Um, Linda's slightly different. She wants to manage straight away. So we put her into a temporary appliance. We put her into the Blue Pro. Um, and we wanted some kind of outcome. Was this going to work? Can we get her back? Can we get her license back? So we used, at that stage, we used the ResMed apnea link. I'd probably use the night owl now. And we, we were quite honestly, we were just lucky. Um, she returned an AHI of four, which was below, um, which was actually normal level. So we communicated this with her doctor and uh, she got her license back in that Monday with the temporary appliance. Now, uh, we want to get a definitive appliance. I chose the Norval, um, one, because I get success with it. I had a history of success. We've got one of the lowest failure rates in Europe. And the main reason for, for Linda was that it was small. She had that big tongue, and I wanted something uh, that she was able to tolerate. Also, we gave her a range of appliances. It's the one that she chose as well. So how do we make this appliance? We're going to continue our digital journey. We're going to go to the CAD CAM design. So the, the lab in London with David Doey from MD Dental Services, he checks it and helps with the design, then goes to Lyon in France, and they start to design. Remember, we don't have a physical bite, so the appliance is actually made on a virtual articulator, and this is all I'm going to get from ResMed. This is secret. Part of their success is that they, with all the appliances, actually with Prosomnus and with the, um, the Somnodent appliances as well, using digital technology, they can actually calculate um, the retention and with the Norval, we use this novel clipping zone, which actually translates the retentive force into a horizontal direction. Um, it means that there's less, much, there's a less chance of actually tilting teeth. So this is the appliance, this is Linda's, and this is the final draft. And it's produced by a process called laser sintering, and it's a polyamide uh, number 12 that is used. And this is the outcome. This is my smile um, in my before and after gallery. Um, and just look at the fit. Um, it's twin block mechanics, and um, the workflow produces something that's very, very tolerable. So when we fit it, that's that's. I tell the patient that is the start. I normally make realistic um, expectations. I say, look, you will snore tonight. We want you to get used to the fit. In our audits in the practice, in 75% of the patients, we actually get it first time. Um, so we send them away with the expectation, tell your partner you're still going to snore. And usually they come back and say, uh, I didn't snore. Um, we may have titrated it too much, in which case we alter the connecting rods to bring the mandible slightly further back and take um, pressure off the joint. Very importantly, we need to communicate that this is successful and accuracy is most important. This is a patient, Siobhan, who travelled about, she had about a four hour, four hour round trip to see us. Um, she said that she wasn't snoring after it was fitted and her sleep partner confirmed that. We tested her with the night oil because she was going to her local sleep clinic to get tested again. 
she still had a score of 31, which was severe sleep apnea. The only like, rationale I can come up with that her snoring wasn't loud enough to disturb her or a sleep partner. We got her to adjust the appliance by half a millimetre and it came from 31 down to 7. We wanted to get that below 7. Remember below 10 is a success for us. So with sleep hygiene we told her no coffee after 2, no alcohol at night and don't eat 4 hours before you go to bed and we got her down to 3. She was discharged from her clinic. Linda, we, because she had her sleep studies done in the local hospital, we, we, we wanted them to do the sleep studies again. Um, so Linda beforehand was severe sleep apnea with an AHI of 34. In the hospital, the best rec recording she could get on the CPAP was 12, which was still mild sleep apnea. When she had the Norval in and was recorded by the local um, sleep clinic and hospital, we got a score of two. So does digital technology give us a better outcome? In Linda's case, I think it did, because the ORCID study from ResMed will show that um, CAD CAM appliances are better than non-CAD CAM appliances in, in their particular appliance. And the reason is because the material is digitally made. It means we can use a different material which is stronger. It can be thinner and we don't have to open the occlusal vertical dimension as much to get that protrusion and that's what gives us success. Success for Linda came for me at a quarter to eleven on a Friday morning when she sent me this text message. <clears throat> She'd been at the local respiratory department and her respiratory ph physician had discharged her. The letter that she then got in the post that reason why she texts me says from the consultant she, he says she should not pose any great risk to herself or any other drivers and I don't feel she needs additional treatment such as CPAP. Um, that's our success. That's Linda's success, that's Linda's story. Um, so, but we still keep her under review. So I like to think of the Narval appliance and all the appliances. This is the visible bit you can see. This is the cathedral which can change someone's life. But underneath, it is only successful and will be a success if there is a foundation of learning, knowledge, uh, respect for the patient of what is best for them and not for ourselves. So thank you for listening. I hope you, that this lays a foundation stone for, for some of you. And if we can help in any way, we'd be very grateful. Thank you.